And I'll just state for the record, I don't believe Rosenstein or Ms. Yates intentionally submitted false information to the court. Uh, with that, uh, Senator Klobuchar is next. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Ms. Yates, are you, there you go. Okay, good. That's Ms. Klobuchar. To see you, Ms. Yates. Yeah. yeah, I want to take a moment, um, having been listening to the last uh, questions, I want to take a moment to actually thank you uh, for your dedicated service to our country. I have spent some time uh, in your state of Georgia and know how respected you are from your time as U.S. attorney uh, on both sides of the aisle. And also, all that you did um, is set such an example for career employees in the Justice Department because uh, that was you and you've spent your career working on justice. And so I want to thank you for that and um, don't want the people watching this hearing to have a different impression of you, uh, who I greatly admire. And I think it's really important as we look at um, Senator Hawley's questionings, not to lose sight of the context in which the investigations into Michael Flynn and Carter Page took place, which was a concerted Russian effort uh, to interfere with our elections, an effort that continues to this day. Uh, we all know that. Um, Many of us, it's been public, and we recently had some classified briefings that I can't go into, uh, but we know this is continuing. As Deputy Attorney General, you received and reviewed intelligence about Russian interference in our 2016 election and helped to coordinate the response. Uh, what was your understanding of uh, that attack, which, by the way, has been verified by Trump intelligence officials, people that were appointed by this president, um, including Dan Coates, uh, the director of intelligence, uh, who once said that they were emboldened and getting bolder, including Christopher Ray has said similar things. Has the United States ever confronted a coordinated effort by a foreign power of this magnitude to interfere in our election? Well, first, let me thank you for your very kind words, Senator Klobuchar. I really appreciate that. But, but secondly, your point is actually spot on. That the attack, and it, let, let's be really clear about this, this was an attack on our democracy. And this attack was absolutely unprecedented. The Russians were coming at us with multi, through multiple um, means. There was a, a, an organized effort to break into the DNC and to hack the emails and to systematically release them. There was a social media campaign aimed at Hillary Clinton as I said, they were monkeying around in the state election systems. All of this is going on. And then we find that it is for the purpose of trying to put the thumb on the scale for one particular candidate here to try to aid the election of Donald Trump and to hurt Hillary Clinton. And then beyond that, we find out then early on from Mr. Papadopoulos that the Russians had actually reached out to the Trump campaign prior to this release of emails, offering and suggesting that they could assist um, with, the, with the anonymous release of emails. So this was an unprecedented attack on our democracy and an investigation that, that required all of the intel community and, and everybody else to, to really bore down on this to try to figure out what happened. And when you last testified before this committee in May of 2017, we talked about the dangers of having a high-ranking security official like former National Security Advisor Mike Flynn uh, caught on tape with a foreign official saying one thing in private and then caught in public saying another thing to the Vice President of the United States. That would be Vice President Pence. Um, just so we are clear on the dangers of national security officials being compromised in this way, can you talk about the national security risks of blackmail? And, you know, this is a, a classic technique of the Russians. Look, you don't want anybody um, within the U.S. government to be compromised with a foreign adversary. But here, our great concern was, was that the Russians knew that General Flynn was, had not only engaged in these back-channel discussions with him, but that he was misleading. He had lied about it to the vice president and others. And beyond just lying to them, he had actually sent them out to lie to the American people about this. Remember that case with the vice president who didn't yeah. know, and he was lied to by Flint. 
Mm-hmm. That's right. And it seems like a lifetime ago right now, but this was a big thing at the time. And mm-hmm. exactly the kind of thing that we were fearful about that would give the Russians potentially leverage over General Flynn. Mm-hmm. And just the last things I wanted to ask about here is the special counsel found that Russian interference in our election was, quote, sweeping and systematic. And the investigation ultimately, as you know, resulted in 34 indictments of individuals and convictions of six of the president's associates and advisors on federal charges. Are you aware of any facts that call into question the finding in the special counsel's report that the Russian government interfered in the 2016 presidential election in sweeping and systematic fashion or that the Russian government perceived it would benefit from a Trump presidency and work to secure the outcome? No, not only am I not aware of anything inconsistent, I believe that the bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee came to the same conclusion. They did. Are you aware of any facts that call into question the assessment of FBI Director Ray that Russia's interference in our elections is ongoing and that its infer- interference in the 2018 midterms was, in his words, a dress rehearsal for the 2020 elections? No, and in fact, I think that's something that we all need to really be vigilant about, is that this is not just something that happened in the past. This is happening right now as we sit here today. Exactly. And in fact, that there are people that have been appointed by President Trump who are well aware of this and actually working uh, to make sure that a foreign country uh, does not, is not able to influence our election. But as you know, one of the ways they do this is not just trying to hack into all 50 states' election systems, which they tried. Uh, it is also about what goes out on social media. Um, and so that is where a lot of our education efforts go have to go because a lot of the stuff is just false uh, things that people say about candidates. Are you aware of any facts that call into question the findings in the special counsel's report that lay out more than 120 contacts between the Trump campaign back in that time period of 2016 and individuals linked to Russia? No, I'm not. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. I want to make sure that we understand what happened here. Uh, You mentioned Mr. Papadopoulos. Are you saying that Mr. Papadopoulos met with Russians on behalf of the campaign? I am saying that Mr. Papadopoulos, as I believe you know, Senator Graham, was approached by an individual who was associated with... No, that's not my question. Is there any evidence Mr. Papadopoulos met with Russians on behalf of the campaign? Mr. Papadopoulos was a foreign policy advisor for the campaign and met with an individual See, Mr. Papadopoulos, was he charged with colluding with the Russians? Senator Graham, you're, you're forgetting about the context and the timing. No, what, what I don't want to do, with all due respect, is that the Mueller report is out, nobody got indicted, and we're not going to go after these people twice and su- suggest that they're treasonous, because in the Papadopoulos transcribed interviews he didn't know about. He said to work with the Russians would be treason. I would never do that. I just don't want to bring these people back up and suggest they did something they didn't do. Uh, Senator Tillis. Senator, I did not mention treason with Mr. Papadopoulos at all. And as I think you know, well, yes, when there, he talked to a, a confidential human source, he denied this, but we now know that the information that he provided to the foreign intelligence official um, but, and in August so was absolutely correct. He was getting Is he a Russian he was agent? Intelligence. Was he a Russian agent? He was, he was connected with Russian intelligence. Really? <laughs> Man, that's a new revelation. Uh, Senator Tillett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Yates, one thing you may want to do is pull up a little bit closer to the mic if you can. We're hearing you, but I think we're straining to hear. Um, In response to some of uh, Chair Graham's questions and Senator Cornyn's uh, uh, questions, you characterized uh, Comey. I think you said that uh, when Senator Graham used the word rogue, you said that's a a word you could use. And uh, Senator Cornyn's discussion with you. You said that there was certainly a violation of some of the rules of the norms and uh, some of the behavior of those involved in the investigation was not ideal. Um, Now, what about Mr. Orr? Uh, Could we use similar words to describe Mr. Orr's behavior over the course of this investigation? Well, and let me 
let me clarify one thing here because I, I think it's important that we be accurate. I said that Director Comey's decision to go interview General Flynn without coordinating that interview with us could be characterized as rogue. Mm -hmm. I was not characterizing Director Comey generally as rogue. So I think it's important to be accurate and fair there. Now, uh, with respect to... Go ahead, Ms. Yates, on Mr. Orr. On Mr. Oh, Orr, just in terms of his behavior, I know back in November of 2016, um, uh, he was apparently aware that uh, Steele was desperate to prevent uh, President Trump uh, from being elected. Was that information shared with you in the uh, intervening no, days or weeks? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, none of that information was shared with me. No. And I don't think that Bruce Orr should have been having those conversations without telling us at the Justice Department about it. Yeah. Um, the, uh, You've been in, uh, you were in the Department of Justice for 27 years, and thank you for your service. Uh, if you take a look at, uh, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a prosecutor, but I have read Horowitz's report. Does any of that just make you angry with the, uh, the lack of what I consider to be professionalism? These, these folks that were involved in this investigation are highly trained and educated. Is it fair to say that there weren't any rookies put in a position to provide you with evidence or, or provide you with information to make a decision? Well, I would certainly agree with you that the errors and omissions here were totally unacceptable. Yeah, so Mr. And, I'm sorry, Mr. And, and honestly, I think a lot of people are interrupting you. It has to do with delay and the fact that we're virtual, so I apologize for that. But, you know, it, it, it just seems to me the cynic in me makes it hard to believe when, we, when they knew what they knew about the credibility of the Steele dossier that they wouldn't think that that's important to bring up the chain of command when you're making critical decisions. Is that something that you feel like anybody in that, in that whole process, anyone, uh, whether they were working w w for you or around you leading up to uh, information that you were acting on, it seems to me that some of these people should have been disciplined or fired. Do you agree with that? Well, look, I don't know what is going on within the FBI and their internal discipline process, so I can't speak to that. But I can say that I believe that this information should have been provided to the lawyers in the National Security Division who were working with them on the FISA applications. I don't think there's any doubt but, about that. But just getting inside, also, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Yates. But I also uh, trust Inspector General Horwitz's conclusion that he did not find any evidence that any of these agents were acting with bias or any kind of political motive. Um, you know, when I looked at, and read the Horowitz report to, to try to figure out, even though it's no longer in office anymore, what went wrong, what you seem to have are agents who superimposed and used their own judgment for what was material or what was exculpatory and decided then what they would provide to the lawyers in the National Security Division. And that's not how it should work. They should be giving all of that information to the lawyers in NSD so that those lawyers can make that determination. Ms. Yates, could you at least understand if, if you combine uh, some of their actions, their errors and omissions, and some of the personal communications between some of those involved, why a skeptic would maybe find it hard to believe to take a generous view of it just being an honest mistake? Well, Senator, the Inspector General reviewed over a million documents. I believe he did over 170 interviews. So I think he's in a better position than I am to be able to answer that question. And he found, again, that there was no evidence of bias or a political motive. Ms. Yates, do you believe the DOJ uh, has ever really been in a, or do you believe the DOJ um, can actually charge someone under the, under the Logan Act? Can it? Um, I, I, frankly, Senator, I've never engaged in that analysis because we were not at a point of making a final determination as to whether General Flynn would be charged under the Logan Act. But as I was trying to make clear to Senator Graham, that was not the prism through which we were examining this. Did you ever we seriously did you ever seriously consider prosecuting Flynn under the Logan Act? I, we didn't make an official decision when I was there, but I think I believed it was very unlikely that we would prosecute him under the Logan Act. Again, it was a counterintelligence threat not a criminal prosecution of the Logan Act that was the focus. Thank you, Mr. Yates. Senator Coons. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman Graham and uh, Ranking Member Feinstein. Uh, thank you, Ms. Yates, for your 27 years of service to the uh, United States Department of Justice and for your uh, testimony here today. Uh, let me just begin uh, at the outset, it, it's sort of a framing here. Uh, do you have any doubt uh, that Russia attacked the United States during the 2016 presidential election with the intention of changing the outcome or influencing the outcome of that election? No. And do you have any reason to be concerned that the Russians may, in fact, uh, be trying to do that again for the 2020 election? I think all of us should be very concerned about that, Senator, as our intelligence community is trying to tell us. Um, let me go back to some issues that have been touched on before, but make sure we've had a chance to explore them. Carter Page was never charged uh, in the Russia investigation, and out of the whole 448 pages of the Mueller report, only eight pages uh, pertain to Carter Page, but uh, there's been some focus on it today. Um, so just tell us uh, briefly, if you would, when did you learn of the errors in the Carter Page FISA application? Long after I left office. Uh, and when that FISA application reached your desk as Deputy Attorney General, after several layers of departmental review, what were you looking for? When you reviewed that, what were you looking for? And what was appropriate for you to be looking for? And thank you for that, Senator, because I would like to explain what the process is for FISA. I was looking to determine whether or not, given the facts that had been sworn to in the affidavit from the FBI, whether that met the legal standard for FISA. And you're right, it's, it's not just several layers of review. There were seven different layers of review at the Department of Justice. And I would expect a similar number of layers of review at the FBI. And there had been quite a good bit of back and forth before the original FISA was signed. There was about a month um, of back and forth between the National Security Division lawyers and the lawyers, excuse me, and the agents at the FBI. And when you did ultimately learn that there were errors in that, um, did that strike you as inappropriate, uncalled for, in violation of practice and tradition? Uh, absolutely. And, and as I've said, not only was it unacceptable, I, you know, I had great concern about this, how this impacts the department's credibility, both with the FISA court and otherwise. And that's why it is incumbent upon department lawyers and agents, not just in a high profile case, but in any case, to work hard to be absolutely scrupulously accurate in every single document that is filed. So when you went to the White House on January 26th, uh, you had something serious to tell White House Counsel Don McGahn. Uh, you went to tell him, if I understand correctly, that the President's National Security Advisor, General Flynn, could be blackmailed uh, because he was lying about the content of his conversations with the Russians. Is there any doubt in your mind that General Flynn lied about his conversations with the Russians? No, there's not. Uh, General Flynn, in fact, pled guilty uh, to lying to the FBI. Um, some have called lying to the FBI, which is a felony, by the way, um, a process crime. Um, could you explain why lying to the FBI in the, in the context uh, that we're talking about here strikes at the very heart of the criminal justice system? Certainly, Senator. Well, first, and in connection with any investigation, the only way that the Department of Justice can go about its job is if people, when they are interviewed by the FBI, are truthful and candid and provide complete information. That's the only way to be able to sift through and figure out what the facts are and to be able to determine if charges should be filed. And given your instance, knowledge... If I could, uh, given your knowledge of the Flynn case and, and your 27-year career at Justice, were you surprised when DOJ moved to dismiss the case after General Flynn had pled guilty to lying to the FBI? I was very surprised by that. And let me ask a closing question, if you could. Why was it important to interview General Flynn? What was the purpose um, that underlay um, questioning General Flynn? General Flynn had had conversations with the Russian ambassador, back channel, secret conversations, neutering the sanctions to the U.S. government, and, and had been covering it up, had been providing false information to the vice president and others to put out publicly. We, we being the government, needed to know what was going on here. Was General Flynn acting on his own, or was he working with others? 
because the investigators needed to be able to figure out what the relationship was between the campaign and the Russians. And had General Flynn been honest, had he told them the truth in this interview, then the agents would have learned then what they only learned much, much later after he finally told the truth. And that is that these were not off-the-cuff conversations that he was having with the Russian ambassador. But rather, these were conversations that were carefully organized and planned with other members of the Trump transition. And that he also had been very careful to lie about and cover up, even to the point of sending his deputy out when the news first broke of this, to, to call the Washington Post and to give them false information and to say that he had never discussed sanctions at all. The cover up continued after that as he told lies to more and more people. Well, thank you, Ms. Yates. Thank you for your testimony uh, and for your service to our nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, did what General Flynn do, did he commit a crime, ma'am? When you say what General Flynn did, which... Was it a crime? What talking about? Talking to, the, uh, talking to the Russian ambassador. Again, Senator, I know I'm a broken record on this. We were doing a counterintelligence okay. investigation. Thank you. Point. Not a criminal investigation. Senator Kennedy. Counselor, thank you for appearing today voluntarily. Um, did Donald Trump violate the law by colluding with Russia to influence the 2016 presidential election? I think Special Counsel Mueller found that there was insufficient evidence to establish a conspiracy between Donald Trump and the Russian campaign. You agree with I that? I'm in no position to be, to, I wasn't part of that investigation. I've read the Mueller report like I presume all so of So there's you. some doubt in your mind? I, Senator, I didn't say that. I just don't think that I'm in a position to opine on that when all I've done is read the Mueller report. You just report. can't bring yourself to say that he didn't violate the law? No, S Senator, you're putting words in my mouth. No, ma'am. I that certainly was a question. accept. I accept and trust Special Counsel Mueller in his determination that there was insufficient evidence for that. I, I accept that. You don't like Donald Trump, do you? I don't like. I don't respect the manner in which he has carried out the presidency. Okay. You despise Donald Trump, don't you? No, I, I don't despise anyone, Senator. Okay. Um, isn't it true that there were a handful of people at the FBI that, that uh, despised Donald Trump and wanted to do everything they could do to keep him from being president? I can't speak as to whether other people despised Donald Trump. Were you part of that group? No, Senator, I was not. Isn't it true that there were a handful of people at the Department of Justice during the Obama administration that despised Donald Trump and did everything there in their power to keep him from being president? I'm not aware of anyone at the Department of Justice doing anything to try to keep Donald Trump from becoming president. Were you part that of that group? Inconsistent. I'm sorry. Were you, were you part of that group? No, and I, I'm not aware of anybody doing that, and that would not only surprise me, but shock me. Was the, uh, would it be fair to say that the, Strike that. The Steele dossier was a, was a keystone of the Russian collusion investigation, wasn't it? No, it was not. It was a, a part of the Carter Page FISA affidavit. But in fact, I think if you read the Mueller report, you'll see that the Steele dossier does not play a role at all. So you don't think it was important? You don't think it was important to the uh, FISA applications? As I just said, Senator, yes, with respect to the FISA applications in Carter Page. But your question was not that. Your question was with respect to Special Counsel Mueller's investigation. All right, fair enough. Uh, let me be sure I understand you. Was the, was the uh, Steele dossier uh, critically important to the FISA applications? Yes, it was. We, there was information with respect to okay. Carter Page. Not to cut you off, but I've only got five minutes, and I think we can agree on this. Um, the steel dossier was junk, wasn't it? Uh, the steel dossier, had, when you say junk, I don't really know how to describe that. 
Um, what did you think about it? You thought it was true? You think it's true? Senator, there's information that was in the dossier that certainly is called into question now. I haven't been at the well, Department no of Justice. Well, no kidding. Uh, well, May I finish my answer, please, Senator? Sure, I'm sorry. You're right. I apologize, with Counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. My question was, uh, isn't it a fact that the Steele dossier is junk? I think that there is certainly evidence now that there was not at the time that calls into question the reliability of many portions of the Steele dossier. Okay. I have Did you check to see if it was junk? Time. It was junk before you signed off on the FICE applications? Senator, the affidavit that was provided by the FBI sets forth the factual basis, and we rely upon the FBI to be the fact finders. So you didn't independently process. check? No, Senator, I did not independently fact check, and I'm not exactly sure how I okay. would go let, about doing it. Let me be sure I understand. Sure. Let me be sure I understand. Um, mm -hmm. You signed off on two of the applications. Uh, you, you're going, you're asking for permission to surveil uh, uh, somebody who is close to a candidacy for the President of the United States in one instance, and in the second instance actually was the President of the United States. And you took no independent steps to see if the Steele dossier was accurate. Is that your testimony? Senator, I'm sorry, I'm not following your question when you talk about who well, was let the me, let me try to be Well, let me try to be clearer. The, the Steele dossiers was critical to, to at least um, several of the FISA applications, one of which you signed off on. You With said respect that, to that the, the page. Let me finish my question. You said that the Steele dossier, um, with hindsight, may not have been completely accurate. You're investigating a president of the United States, and you didn't check to see if it was accurate? Let me put it another way. Let's suppose my staff came to me tomorrow and said, we have, a, uh, I w we have evidence that Chairman Graham is colluding with China to influence the, the presidential election. <laughs> and uh, I say, okay, what's the basis of that? White House. And they say, uh, we have a reliable source that we can trust, and we want you to call him out. And I go out and call him out with verifying the reliable source. Am I, is, is, am I not like a rock, only dumber? Isn't that what you did? No, that's not at all what I did, Senator. First of all, the FISA so, well, hearing... Then tell me I every thought... step you took to verify the veracity of the Steele dossier, which was junk. You didn't do anything, did you? Let me ask you one last question. Yeah. If I could get a chance to answer your question. Yes, ma'am. Well, well, Wait a minute, M Mr. Chairman. Let, yeah, accusations she, are being made. Sure, sure. The Let witness should have an opportunity to uh, respond. I agree. You, you may respond. Thank you very much. Well, I think, Senator, you were implying here that this FISA application was on Donald Trump. As we all know, the FISA application was not on a candidate or president. It was on an individual who was formerly with the campaign, was not a current member of the campaign. Secondly, with respect to the process, the FISA process is such that the FBI, as I've indicated to you, is the fact finder. They have the files. They engage in what's called a Woods process, where they are required to document that every single fact in the affidavit is accurate and that they can trace it back to a specific place in the FBI files that established that. A problem, I think, that the, that the page uh, FISA process has revealed is that just because there is a fact in the FBI files that establishes, I mean, our document that establishes that fact, there were also inconsistent facts that apparently were not included in that affidavit. Lawyers in the National Security Division spent a lot of time working with the FBI in putting together the affidavit and the application here. 
but they necessarily must rely upon the FBI, who are the fact finders in this, to be certain of the accuracy. And in fact, that's exactly how the FISA application is set up. It is the FBI agent. Mr. Chairman, can, can, I'm, 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 now I'm confused. Listen, I, I, could, could you just tell me every step you took to verify the, the accuracy of the Steele dossier? I relied upon the yeah. FBI as the fact finders here and the lawyers in the National Security Division to vet the accuracy of, of the FISA application. And All of them hated job, Trump, right? No, Senator, they did not hate Trump. Well, if I may. And, you know, I have to say, I have to speak up here for the career men and women of the Department of Justice. You know, there were... Oh, I'm not talking about all the career men and women. I think you and your colleagues have, have tarnished the reputation of the FBI. Awesome. So, uh, if I may, we'll go to the next, next am I, witness. Am I out of time, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> barely, barely, okay. just a second. One thing I do want to, to, to make a point, we'll go to Senator Blumenthal, is I accept that Ms. Shates did not do be an independent investigation of the affidavit, and I agree with Senator Whitehouse. I think most people in that situation are not required to do that. But I, I do want to ask one question. <clears throat> Once the dossier was known to be unreliable, Ms. Shates, do the people who did the interview, do they have a duty to notify their superiors about their concerns and about the information they found? Are you talking about the interview that took place at the end of January? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and that, yes, they did. Can you imagine a circumstance where they did not do that? I, I can't speculate as to what actually happened, but, and this was in the final days of my time at the Department of Justice. I, I but guess. Yes, yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you that the information from that interview should have been provided to the lawyers in the National Security Division so it could be incorporated in the FISA applications. Should it also have been provided to Mr. McCabe, who is in charge of the investigation? I mean, I don't know internally how it works at the FBI. I would expect that would happen, but I, I don't know whether it did or not. Finally, do you think it's fair for this committee to ask those questions? It's not really up to me to be telling you what's fair and what but, isn't But who knew fair. what when? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I don't think it's, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Senator Blumenthal. That's what we're going to do. We're going to find out who knew what, when, and what they knew, did about it. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just say, uh, Ms. Yates, thank you for your appearance today. Thank you for your patience with us, including myself, because I am likely to repeat some of the questions that you may have already answered. Uh, but uh, let me say at the very outset, when you appeared before this committee on uh, in May of 2017, I said, among other things, quote, uh, whether we agree or disagree with you, I hope there are young prosecutors and young members of our Intelligence Committee who will watch this hearing and say, that's the kind of professional I want to be, not just expert, but a person of deep conviction and conscience. And I repeat that today because it is uh, something I feel as deeply now as I did then about you, Ms. Yates, and I appreciate your service to our country and uh, your being here to go through some of these questions which have been repetitive and even, with all due respect, unnecessarily antagonistic. Uh, and I want to come back to one of the fundamental issues here. When uh, the recommendation was made by uh, a number of the FBI agents to close the investigation on January 4th, so far as you know, were those agents aware of the conversation between Michael Flynn and Ambassador Kislyak? And Senator, I think you're referring to the specific counterintelligence investigation of Michael Flynn. My understanding is no, they did not know about those conversations. They did not but know again, about that. I don't think Go this ahead. is really a red herring here because this interview, I wasn't even aware that there was a specific counterintelligence investigation opened up on General Flynn at that point. 
We didn't need that to go interview General Flynn. The circumstances here called out for an interview in the context of the broader investigation. And in fact, you've just answered what was going to be my next question. Uh, the, the continuing investigation into Michael Flynn was legitimate, correct? When he was questioned by the FBI himself. Yes. And his lies to the FBI were material, correct? And they certainly were. Uh, now, the president, uh, or I should say the, the Department of Justice, uh, has moved to dismiss the case against Michael Flynn uh, on the basis that his false statements to the FBI were not material or the uh, investigation was not legitimate. But I think that is clearly and powerfully contradicted by the evidence that you've given us today. Let me say, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, and I, I know others of our colleagues have made reference to it, but over the past few days, we've received classified briefings about the continuing, absolutely shocking and startling threat from malign foreign interference in our election that is potentially ongoing. Uh, and these briefings, I think, emphasize to us our responsibility to focus on the present and the future in terms of that threat. And I hope that this investigation or these series of hearings will in no way distract us or deflect the nation's attention from that continuing foreign threat to our election security. It's absolutely chilling based on the facts we've received in a classified setting. I believe the American people need and deserve to know them. I think these facts should be declassified immediately. We have a responsibility to address them in this committee and elsewhere. And I hope that the time and attention and energy that these hearings are taking will in no way distract us from that ongoing task. Uh, and it's a challenge that is central to our responsibility. It's not just peripheral or convenient. It is central and essential. Uh, Ms. Yates, I want to give you finally an opportunity to clarify a part of your testimony relating to uh, George Papadopoulos. I think you were referring to uh, emails that uh, Russia planned to release uh, involving contacts with him. Just to clarify, were you suggesting that Papadopoulos was a Russian or a foreign agent? Oh, no, I was not. I was, uh, what I was suggesting was is that he had gotten that information from someone who was associated with the Russians, not that he is a Russian agent. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal, for clearing that up for Mr. Papadopoulos' sake. Uh, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Yates, when did you first become aware that the Obama administration was surveilling the Donald Trump campaign? The Obama administration was not surveilling the Donald Trump campaign. So a FISA application is not surveillance? The FISA application was for Carter Page, who was a former member of the Trump campaign at that point. So, so your testimony is that, that, that the investigation in Carter Page had nothing to do with the Donald Trump campaign? No, I'm suggesting you asked me if we were surveilling the campaign. You, you don't get and it I both said, ways. Is it the campaign or not? Uh, Senator, I'm trying to give you what is the accurate information here. Carter Page was a former member of the Trump campaign at the time that the FISA was initiated. And, and what was the reason for the FISA on Carter Page? There were a number of reasons. First, we had gotten the information that I was trying to point out here, that the Russians had made the overture that they wanted to be able to assist the Trump campaign. No, hold on, you said it had nothing to do with the Trump campaign. I said that he was not a member of the Trump campaign at the time that we initiated the uh, FISA. Ms. Yates, in your time at the Department of Justice, 
Are you aware of any other political opponents of President Obama that, that were being surveilled? Again, Senator, if you're talking about the court authorized surveillance of Carter Page. I, I, I'm then, asking, are you aware of any surveillance of any other political opponents? Any other candidates for president in 2016? There were a whole bunch of them, including the chairman and myself. Were either of us being surveilled? Of yes or case. no? The answer to that is no, and I also think that there was also no information that the Russians were working to aid another candidate other than Donald Trump. Okay, so your testimony is no other candidate in 2016 was being surveilled other than Carter Page and the Trump campaign. Is that, is that right? Other than Carter Page. Okay. When did you first become aware of the investigation and, and the surveillance on Carter Page? When the FISA application was presented to me in October, I knew that the NSD lawyers were working on it for some period of time prior to that with the FBI. So it would have been in the October range. I, okay. don't, mean, I don't mean to interrupt, but wasn't Papadopoulos also being taped? Ms. Yates, the, the chairman asked a good question. My understanding, I was not aware at the time, but my understanding is that Papadopoulos, that there was a recorded conversation between Papadopoulos and a source, not, not wiretap surveillance. No, but, but the government orchestrated this, right? That's what I know now. Didn't know that at the time. Yes. So we know that the government orchestrated a, a recording of conversations with Papadopoulos and got a warrant against Carter Page. That seems to me surveillance. So when they came to you asking to surveil members of the Trump campaign because of conduct they allegedly did while members of the Trump campaign, what due diligence did you do? Did, did, did you press back at all? You already told Senator Kennedy you just trusted the FBI. You didn't ask about their sources. You did. I mean, what due diligence did you do before signing off on what we now have significant reason to believe was a profound politicization of law enforcement and intelligence. Senator, there was a tremendous amount of process back and forth between the lawyers in the National Security Division and the FBI. Okay, I asked what you did, not, not other lawyers. What due diligence did you do? You were the one signing off on it. And, and with respect to whether the facts were accurate in this, in this instance. So did you inquire whether it was opposition research funded by the DNC or Hillary Clinton? Yes, I did have a discussion about that. With whom? With a lawyer in my office. Would that have been Bruce Orr? No, Bruce Orr was not working on this. So, but his wife was working for Fusion GPS, being paid by Hillary Clinton and the DNC, and he certainly was actively involved in this investigation. Did you know that? Did, did, did anyone inquire about that? No, I had no idea of that. Learned that from the Inspector General's investigation. And... Bruce Orr was not working with us on any of these FISA applications. You said earlier that nobody was trying to get President Trump. Have, have you read the Horowitz Inspector General report? I have, and Inspector General Horowitz found that he did not, not find any evidence of bias or a political motive. Ms. Yates, with, with all due respect, Inspector General Horowitz found 17 material misstatements in those FISA applications, including a lawyer from the FBI who fraudulently altered a document and submitted it, and in fact took the question, was Carter Page an asset from the FBI, for the CIA? The CIA said yes. He altered the document and changed it to a no. You're telling me that, 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 that nobody wanted to get Trump? How about that lawyer that fraudulently altered a document to, 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 to get this surveillance? I'm telling you that Inspector General Horowitz did over 170 interviews and reviewed more than a million documents. And he's in a better position than I am to be able to make a conclusion about whether there was evidence of a political motive or bias. Yeah. Ms. Yates, let, let me just make a, a, a final observation. You, you mentioned in your testimony the, the principled career men and women at the Department of Justice and the FBI, and you're right. There, there are tremendous principles whose integrity has been called into question by the profound politicization of the leadership of the department 
and of the Bureau, and to sign off on turning the FBI and the CIA into a, a tool of opposition research and attacking your political opponents, and to go all the way to the Oval Office as you did on January 5th with President Obama and Joe Biden going after their political opponents, it's wrong and it has done immeasurable damage to the professionals and, and the men and women of integrity at the Department of Justice and at the Bureau. And uh, now I think Senator Hirono, but I will say, I want Ms. Yates to understand, Horowitz didn't find any bias in opening up the counterintelligence investigation, but he was dumbfounded by the series of events that occurred, including manipulating evidence and all the withholding of information from the court. He said, uh, that's hard to explain. Not for me, it's not. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the person who has very much politicized the Department of the Attorney General is the current Attorney General, Bill Barr. There's been a lot of talk today about the uh, Justice Department's uh, uh, errors and omissions in the FISA application process and the IG uh, investigation where they interviewed 100 people, looked at a million documents, and as uh, Ms. Yates just testified, there was no finding of political bias or improper motivations in the beginning of that investigation. But what hasn't been brought out is the fact that uh, Christopher Ray, the FBI, FBI director in response to the IG's recommendations, has taken more than 40 corrective, corrective steps to address the concerns. FBI director Ms. Yates has warned that Russia is engaged in information warfare and even as we speak, they are continuing to interfere with our 2020 presidential election and you noted that their interference in 2016 was shocking and massive. Do you think our country is adequately prepared to combat Russian interference in this upcoming election? You know, I'm no longer in government, Senator, so I don't know what's going on. But gosh, I hope so. And I hope that, that this is an, an all-of-government approach because regardless of whether folks are Democrats or Republicans or what their views may be on anything else, I think and hope that we all share the same objective, that we want to protect the integrity of our elections. I completely agree with you, but sad to say uh, this leads me into the next question because uh, it seems President Trump is not taking Russian interference in our elections seriously. And to your knowledge, has President Trump ever punished Russia or even criticize Russia for its attack on our democracy in 2016? Well, I'm not an authority on that from an official standpoint. I can't recall an instance now. I'm not saying that it's never happened, but I sure can't remember one. Well, if he has, I'd like somebody to point it out to me. And um, I don't think he has even acknowledged the current efforts by Russia to undermine our upcoming elections. Going on, on uh, January 26, 2017, you warned the White House that um, President Trump's National Security Advisor Michael Flynn had lied in denying that he discussed U.S. sanctions with the Russian ambassador. And yes, he had a back channel uh, conversations going on. Uh, did General Flynn pose a national security risk to the United States? That was certainly our concern, Senator, as that the Russians had leverage over General Flynn. And the Russians will use leverage whenever they can. And somebody as close to the president as being the national security advisor, I would say that uh, he posed a national security risk, and that is how I take your response. Now, during an earlier back and forth with the chairman, there was a question on whether General Flynn's discussions with the Russian ambassador about sanctions related to a run-of-the-mill policy difference. You know, what's the problem of an incoming administration trying to reset their relationship with another country, but is it standard run-of-the-mill stuff for a member of an incoming administration to undermine sanctions imposed by the current administration against a country that massively interfered in our elections, particularly when that country interfered in favor of the incoming administration? Is this merely a mere resetting, or did it <laughs> raise a lot more concerns? Senator, look, I totally understand that people of good faith can have different views on policies, and you can have a policy difference. But I would hope and expect that Democrat or Republican, Obama administration or Trump administration 
that you would be opposed to the Russians trying to meddle in, in our elections. Yes. And that you would stand unified on that and make sure that we send the adequate message of deterrence that they never do it. And this administration certainly is not sending that adequate message to Russia. You will not interfere with our elections. Now, having spent uh, nearly three decades at the Justice Department, do you believe President Trump's um, obstruction of justice conduct, as described in the Mueller report, was enough to indict him? Do you think he would have been prosecuted were he not the President of the United States? I think it certainly raised a number of troubling scenarios. And having been you know, a prosecutor for a number of years myself, um, let, let me answer it this way. I think that there were a couple of thousand um, former DOJ officials that signed a letter indicating that if that had been somebody else, they would have prosecuted. So, and do you agree with that assessment? Or, uh, I, I think there's some former more, people. Yeah, I, I want to be precise here. I would want to, to to look at the specific allegations, but there certainly were very troubling um, allegations with respect to obstruction. And possibly resulting in multiple felony charges for obstruction of justice were he not a sitting president. That's certainly the Mueller report made it clear that that, that was yeah. stumbling block for his being able to make a conclusion about obstruction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that was a great exchange. You can't tell us whether or not you agree with the conclusion there was no conspiracy between the Trump campaign and the Russians, but you sure as hell feel comfortable opining about the 2,000 people who signed on about obstruction of justice. So let me ask you again, are you okay with the part of the report where Mueller said there was no evidence of a conspiracy between the Trump campaign and the Russians sufficient to proceed forward? The Mueller report did not find that there was no evidence of a conspiracy. What he found was is the, that the evidence. Do you was think there was evidence of a conspiracy? May I, may I please finish sure. my answer? Yeah, go ahead. But I, I absolutely accept that conclusion. I think I said that before of Special Counsel Mueller. He's in a much better position than I am to know the evidence and to evaluate that. Do you think Mueller let Trump off on obstruction of justice? I, I, I don't have a view as to whether he let him off. I have to tell you, I have tremendous respect for Special Counsel Mueller, okay. and I Thank believe you. that he went about doing his job responsibly and in the way that it should be done. So, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Ms. Yates, thank you for coming to us willingly. I actually left the hearing room and came back to my office to ask the questions. I think we can hear you a little better uh, this way and can move through this a bit more quickly. And you won't have to repeat yourself because we do want to get some things on the record. So thank you for this. I want to be sure that I've understood some of your answers and statements. Um, you had a standard process for reviewing FISA applications, is that correct? Department of Justice does, yes. Okay. And you stated that your review of the Carter Page FISA application was no different from any other, is that correct? No, I did not state that. Okay. Was your review of that one any different from any other FISA application? Yes, I reviewed this one more carefully. And what led you to review it more carefully? Because this was obviously a very significant and sensitive matter. Okay. And who briefed you on that application? Who, who actually gave you all the background information and briefed you on that application? There were a number of lawyers, both from the National Security Division and a lawyer on my staff right. in the Deputy Attorney General's office, who had spent a lot of earlier that there were a variety of uh, attorneys from the National Security Division. Did you not have one person in your office that was responsible to clear information and then bring it to you? Yes, as I was trying to explain, there are lawyers in the National Security Division who work on the FISA with the FBI. 
when they go through their levels of approval, it then comes to my office. There was a lawyer in my office who used to be in the National Security Division who's an expert on these matters. She spent a lot of time on this. Okay. And she is the one who provided the most detailed briefings to me, in addition to my reading the FISA. Okay, did you ever suspect that something might be wrong with this information? At the time I signed them, no. No, we... So had you never got... had any, any uh, inclination that something may not be right? So let me ask you this. The agents who falsified and made the inaccuracies that you have said now, you would not have signed it knowing that there were these inaccuracies. Should these agents who knowingly did something wrong and gave false information, should they be held to account? Should they face consequences? Should they face jail time? Look, I certainly think that if there are agents who knowingly and intentionally provide false information in an affidavit, there should be consequences for that. Um, I'm not going to speak to what the agents support further investigation to find out more of the detail of who falsified all of these. Let me ask you. I was trying to say, Senator, I think there's an internal FBI process that would address that. And with respect to the with respect to the inaccuracies and the FISAs that were presented to me, kind of review what those are is there was information that was inconsistent with the information that was in the affidavit. So it's not that the facts in the affidavit were untrue. There was information that also was relevant and should absolutely have been included in that affidavit. Okay. All right. Did you know about the ORS relationship to Steele? No, I did not. You had no knowledge of that? None. But he was in your office, correct? That's right. Okay. Uh, struck Page, that relationship in their vitriol for President Trump, were you aware of that? No. You never, heard any, conversation. You never heard any conversation on it? No, I don't think anyone did until the Inspector General's report. And then um, Comey's disdain for President Trump. You never heard anything on that? I, I don't. I'm not, by saying no, I didn't. I'm not saying that he had disdain for President Trump. I'm, I'm not speaking to that. Okay. And then you never heard any talk about people within the DOJ or the FBI trying to cook up a plot to stop Trump to block his winning and then to block his presidency. No, Senator, and not only did I never hear that, that would have been so out of bounds, we all would have acted to stop that. That is completely antithetical to how the Department of Justice operates. But now we know not aware that transpired. We know that well, that transpired. So, actually, you know, I, 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 case, I have to tell you, I think that this is this is one of the things that gets past that people in Tennessee ask me about. How could you possibly have been in charge over there, never heard this conversation, never heard this disdain, uh, not been aware that there were people who were trying to do, do this? Uh, why were you not curious about Director Comey and the FBI being opposed to your intention to notify the White House. You weren't curious about that, it seems. Why do you say Flynn did this and it's awful, but yet we know what President Obama said to David Medvedev about give me more flexibility after the election, I'll have more flexibility. You had no problem with that, but then you had problems with these items, these are the inconsistencies that cause people to say who was in charge, how were they watchful, why were they turning a blind eye, if indeed they did turn a blind eye, why were they accepting, and who, who, was, who was paying attention to this? Because people in Tennessee talk to me and they say, how could it be that a private citizen could end up being surveilled and everybody just say, well, it happened. 
and move on. So I know I'm over time, Mr. Chairman. I'll send my time back to you. And Ms. Yates, thank you for uh, being with us today. I yield back. Thank you. And uh, I think our last uh, senator is uh, Senator Booker. But just to put a fine point on that, see if we can all agree with the following. Ms. Yates, uh, when it comes to the FISA warrant application of, regarding Carter Page, there seems to be widespread system failure, and we're trying to correct that. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. Yes, I do agree with that. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do is make sure that never happens again. Thank you. Senator Booker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Ms. Yates, uh, Acting Attorney General, General, as Acting Attorney General, I, there's many occasions where I felt like you uh, stood up uh, for justice uh, and actually brought a lot of uh, important integrity to the system and to our institutions. And I remember uh, being very grateful uh, that you ordered the Justice Department not to defend President Trump's unlawful travel ban, for example, against seven uh, majority Muslim countries. Um, and I've appreciated uh, the way you conducted yourself in that way. And I want to sort of drill down into some of your um, understandings uh, as we see the Justice Department continuing under the Trump administration. Um, in many ways, I believe it's been politicized and manipulated uh, instead of uh, focusing on those interests of justice and democracy. So, for example, we know that Russia wants to interfere in our election this year. Uh, and just as it did in 2016, and we know that they're wanting to help the Trump campaign. But Attorney General Barr has repeatedly struggled, uh, including in a House hearing just last week, to confirm that it would be wrong and illegal for the president to solicit or accept foreign assistance in elections. So I'd like to just pose this question to you. Is it legal or appropriate for a presidential candidate or campaign to solicit or accept help from a foreign government in an election? No, it's not. And beyond that, I would hope that they would report that to law enforcement. I'm grateful. And, 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 and to that point, just, be, uh, just to, to, to make that more succinct, if a campaign hears from a foreign government uh, in the offering of electoral assistance, they should report it to the FBI immediately, correct? Absolutely, yes. And, you know, there's a lot of areas, I believe, where Attorney General Barr has obfuscated or, or in some ways muddled what I think is not only legal clarity, but moral clarity. Uh, we've seen him and other Justice Department leaders intervene in prosecutions arising from the Russian investigation of the two close associates of President Trump. I think Michael Flynn and Roger Stone are examples of that. We've seen Attorney General Barr engineering the removal of U.S. attorneys uh, who uh, apparently uh, were not sufficiently friendly uh, to the president's uh, personal uh, interests. And we've seen Attorney General Barr, Barr distort the findings uh, of the special counsel Mueller's report on the Trump campaign's link to Russian interference and President Trump's later efforts to obstruct that investigation. And so do you think actions like these are consistent with the Justice Department's duty, as you said, uh, and I quote you, to always seek justice and stand for what's right? I think that the highest responsibility of any lawyer at the Department of Justice is to ensure that you're going about doing your job in a way that will inspire the public trust. And the public has to ensure that the, has to be assured that the rules apply the same to everyone. There's no, people who aren't treated specially and that the law is not used as a cudgel to go after people who are enemies or, or, or not friends. And that is the most sacrosanct obligation of the Department of Justice. And so based on your three decades of experience at the Justice Department under presidents of both parties, uh, do you think the department's recent attempts to dismiss the Flynn case uh, have damaged the credibility? Are they unprecedented uh, um, in terms of what you've seen under presidents of both parties? And what do you think should be done about this going forward? Well, I think any time you have something um, like this where there is certainly a appearance as you start there that the, someone who is close to the president is being treated differently. And then when you look at the underlying facts and you see that, in fact, positions are being taken by the Justice Department that have never been taken in any other um, similar cases before. 
and the fact that no career person would sign that pleading. That all does have to give you some pause. And then last week, Attorney General Barr refused to agree that he would wait to release a report by the U.S. Attorney, Attorney uh, John uh, Durham until after the election in November. I, I'd like to enter to the record a New York Times article from today entitled, Will, Barr, Will Bill Barr Try to Help Trump Win the Election? Uh, the article de details Attorney General Barr's apparent efforts to override key Justice Department policies and norms by deploying this and other investigations for political purposes. And uh, if that article can be entered to the record, Mr. Chairman? Uh, without objection. And so, Ms. Yates, the Inspector General's report stated that in the run-up to the 2016 election, you, quote, did not want to do anything that could potentially impact candidate Trump. That's on uh, page 71 and 72. So why is it important for the Justice Department to avoid taking actions just before an election that could, again, I quote, potentially impact it? So this is an important principle that applies not just in the investigation of the president, but in any investigation that could involve an elected official. And you know, I prosecuted public corruption cases as an AUSA, and I'll tell you, we didn't take any action whether it was a a, a, a case involving a local sheriff or a governor or a senator, we wouldn't take any action that could potentially have an impact on the election. And that's not just to be fair to that individual, but also to ensure that the public has confidence that this power is not being used to try to impact an election. In this case, when you mentioned Trump, I have a very specific recollection of um, activity with respect to Paul Manafort and my talking to the FBI to make sure that they weren't doing anything publicly with respect to Mr. Manafort, even though he was no longer even with the campaign at this point, but that they weren't doing anything publicly with respect to Mr. Manafort, because that could be unfair to then candidate Donald Trump. Well, I, I wanna thank you, my time's expired. I just wanna say that, look, I think that retrospective uh, hearings uh, where we're analyzing and looking to get to the truth are important. But to prioritize that over an oncoming election and with the international interference that we all know is going on and with conduct of a attorney general um, that is possibly uh, further eroding uh, the independence of that uh, agency that they run in addition to undermining uh, the, the, the sacrosanct ideals of an independent election. Um, these are the things that we should be looking at right now to prevent uh, what could happen in November uh, that to me would be uh, a, a serious blow uh, to our overall democracy. And I'm hoping that these are issues um, that we can we can explore as a committee. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to go over time. And, uh, and Ms. Yates, it's very actually uh, good to see you again. I, I look forward to the next opportunity we have to connect. Thank you. Uh, I believe that's our last senator. And uh, just wrap it up, Ms. Yates, thank you for appearing. Just want to clear up some things that were brought up. Uh, are you familiar with the Durham investigation? I've read about it. That's all I know. Do you know Mr. Durham? I don't believe we've ever met. Do you have any uh, concerns about his doing something politically wrong? As far as you know, is he an honest man? I don't know Mr. Durham. Okay. So you don't have an opinion one way or the other? I don't. Okay. Is it okay for Mr. Durham to find out uh, how the system failed when it comes to the FISA warrant application? Well, I think the Inspector General did that investigation. Yeah. Is it okay to hold somebody criminally responsible who lies to the court? If someone committed a crime, yes, of course, it's, it's okay to hold them responsible. So if you knew that the dossier was no longer reliable, but you continued to give it to the court, would that be a crime? Well, and I assume you're saying you, because you understand I did not know. No, I, I, no doubt in my mind, ma'am. I've never suggested that you presented false information to the court. Here's what I'm suggesting. Is it possible that one of the most high profile cases in the history of the FBI involving the Trump campaign literally fell apart when it came to the Carter Page warrant application and people above were not told. It's a simple question. The intel analyst who did the 40-page memo in January and another one in March and April, 
provided evidence to the system that the warrant, that the uh, dossier was a bunch of garbage. Is it okay to find out who was told about that? Again, Senator, I think that Inspector General Horowitz did that investigation. No, no he not, didn't. He it's did not. not see, to, no, to ma'am, he never asked. Interest. I asked yeah. him specifically, did you ask the intel analyst, did you talk to anybody about your findings? He said no, that he didn't talk to Comey or McCabe about this. Here's, I believe you when you said that you didn't know the dossier was reliable, that if you had known it was unreliable, you wouldn't have done it. The question for me is, how is it possible that people investigating this case were unaware that it fell apart? Is it okay for Durham to look at that, you think? It's not my position to be saying what John Durham should do or okay. not. Well, but, but, as, a, as a career professional, do you want people held accountable who intentionally lie to the court? Certainly, I would say that if someone intentionally lies to the yeah. court, it should be held accountable. Let's talk yes. about ethical duties. Do you have a duty to give uh, the court and the defense exculpatory information? If you're talking about Brady information, yes. Yes. Uh, so, are you talking about a FISA court or, or a defendant in a criminal Either case? way. Uh, in the Flynn case, one of the reasons they want to drop it is because they found evidence exculpatory that the defense wasn't provided, but we'll have them come in and talk about Flynn. What I want to let the American people know is I don't buy for a minute that there are only two people in the FBI who knew the dossier was garbage and they didn't tell anybody. And I want to make sure this never happens again. I believe you and Rosenstein did not know. I find it impossible to believe that Strzok, McCabe, and Comey were not aware of the fact that the subsource uh, disavowed the dossier. That's what I'm trying to find. That's what I'm trying to put the puzzle together. So what will the committee do next? We're going to talk to the intel analyst and the case agent and two others who interviewed the Russian subsource in January again in March and again in April, and we're going to ask them, oh, by the way, did you tell anybody in the FBI that the reliability of the dossier is going down to zero? And if you did tell somebody, who was it? Then we'll decide as a nation what accountability they should have, whether it be being fired, going to jail, or whatever. That is the purpose of this investigation going forward, is to make sure that the biggest system failure maybe ever at the FBI is not repeated, to make sure that if the FBI is investigating a presidential candidate or a sitting president, that, they, uh, that they're held account when it goes off track. I just find it hard to believe that the dossier was used four times to get a warrant against Carter Page, and nobody knew it was a bunch of garbage, particularly after the January interview of the subsource. I, know, I don't believe you knew. I don't believe... Uh, Rosenstein knew, but the idea that we're going to blame these two people at the bottom of the pyramid is not going to go forward without some serious looking. So what will the committee be doing next? We're going to find out who knew what and when, and if they knew the dossier wasn't reliable and they continued to use it, they're going to be in serious trouble with the law. And Ms. Yates, I appreciate your service to our country, and we will keep the record open for appropriate period of time and the uh, hearing is adjourned.